All right, we're back for part two today, talking with Bruce Opsel, firefighter paramedic from Portland, Oregon, who is uh, just doing some awesome work with effective ventilations and maximizing each one with patient care. And we're going to start right back where we left off. So this all started with my existential question of why an title, title is higher. And so um, let's talk about the new stuff that I've been working on or teaching. And it's um, understanding how to use end title in cardiac arrest and specifically asking two very simple questions. Are we winning or are we not winning? And where we're currently at, I believe, is end title is shouted out in the middle of the code, 65. And then you would say, copy that, end title is 65. Chart that, and then you move on. And then you keep doing your stuff. And so why was it 65? Is it truly that number? Are we winning? Are we not winning? How can we affect those changes to be in that winning ca category, right? And so... But to understand how to get there, we got to understand the physiology a little bit better. Now, end title is, as I talked about, measuring this drug dealer gas exchange process of metabolism, right? So we're always making CO2. Always, 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 always. Just laying around. We're like a big CO2 soup kitchen, right? And so that's what I call our bodies, either a house fire or soup kitchen, right? So as the CO2 is being made and circulated to the heart, Envision like this big bowl of soup is representing like this like process of getting rid of this gas, right? And so CO2 is filling that cup. Now that CO2, it comes up to a certain level. 35 to 40 is our normal range, 35 to 45, right? Now that's the CO2 in our blood. Now how do we measure CO2 in the blood? You guys know? Blood gas. A blood gas, right? Yeah. How do we do it pre-hospitally? We don't. We don't do it, right? Um, Life light, no. Do you guys get nope. ABGs? Um, so a one method to measure that is in the ED setting. It's getting an ABG and measuring various values. One of those values could be the CO2 in the blood. Now, you could get it other ways. You could probably get it in a capillary or in a vein, but that's the way that we would get that measurement, right? And so we have to understand that end title is measuring a respiratory gas that just used to be in the blood, right? And there's a relationship that these two guys have. So we've decided as a body that we want our soup bowl to be at 40, and it's just going to stay there. And so as the CO2 is pouring in, it gets it to that level. If it starts to get high, we got to get that out. So we take a breath, and that's a soup ladle. We're going to dip the soup ladle in. We're going to pull the blood out, the CO2 out, right? And we're just going to keep doing that, right? And if we have too much coming in, then we maybe make the bowl the ladle bigger we dip it more frequently right and now you guys soup inspectors come in you want to know how much soups in that bowl as you put on the nasal cannula and you're going to measure that sample right so if we were to get on a treadmill if i were to get on a treadmill say i start running on the treadmill right my heart rate increases my respirations increase my tidal volume increases if i had a pulse oximeter on is it am i getting hypoxic or something else happening you're likely not getting hypoxic. Right. My sats will probably sit between 96 and 99 the entire time. Yep. Right? So my soup kitchen is producing more CO2, and it's pumping in, and then the, the heart is thinking, like, holy crap, we've got more soup. Let's, let's, mo let's get this stuff out of here. The soup ladle is going to get bigger and get dipped more frequently, and the end tidal value will probably stay the same. And so I have a whiteboard for this, which I know you love, Steve. Yeah. But I essentially write like this CO2 in the blood to the CO2 in the breath and their relationship. Mm -hmm. And when we're healthy and well, they just stay together within five. Mm -hmm. So my CO2 in my breath is five. If we were to measure it in the ABG, the CO2 in our blood would be 40. Just be five or less higher, right? So when I get on that treadmill and I run, the number almost just auto-regulates and stays the same the entire time. The only difference is the change in my heart rate the tidal volume and the respiration rate to auto-regulate that situation. Now, if we get sick and our end tidal is lower, we just if we have a bad heart, cardiogenic shock, or we have less volume, like a sepsis, we just might be ineffective in this process of making and moving soup. 
And so the lines start to spread, and I'm showing you guys this visually, but essentially these lines start to spread. And so the CO2 starts to lessen, and then I don't even know where the CO2 goes in the blood, but it probably starts to rise because it's just not able to get it out as efficiently, right? And so we have like a skew sofa alert that we'll make if the end title's less than 25 and they're hypotensive, high index of suspicion, altered mental status. And so what I want you guys to understand, at least in this class, is that when you're sick, your end title might be a lesser value because the patient has a junky heart or they have lesser volume. And so the lines spread. And when the lines spread, you're sick. And so your end title turns into a variable. That number is measured by their poor performance of their heart or, or how much blood they have or obstructive lungs or some kind of issue. Now, these are patients that are really challenging for me. Conscious patients that have the capability to breathe and pump blood of their own, I'm like constantly like, this is a PE I'm writing in. And then I write it and I follow up and it's not, and I'm sad, <laughs> which is a weird feeling to have because mm -hmm. you want to brag about it for your life, you know, <laughs> that you caught the PE, right? And so um, I want just for like, say, today's lesson talking to you guys, that just to understand that sick and critically ill patients may have an affected end title because of how well they're perfusing and ventilating. Mm -hmm. But for sick, for dead people, for people that are, in cardiac arrest, we are now those variables. So if you were doing chest compressions, you're a variable. And then, Steve, if you're doing ventilations, you're a variable. And so the way that you perform and you perform, like, needs to be in sync and working well. If you do a bad job and you do a good job, so the compressions are poor, ventilations are fantastic, Doesn't you're going to have a lower end tidal number. And if you're having airway issues and your chest compressions are fantastic, you're going to have a lower end tidal value. And so that's why it's so challenging to understand in the pre-hospital setting is that we're trying to understand that we're variables that are measuring a now variable, right? So it's like mm -hmm. really confusing. And I've learned this with some of our medical directors that they don't use end tidal the same way. They know the shark fin stuff and they know what to do when it's high and when it's low and how to address those needs. And we can talk about that, but... I would love it for a, a medical director to work on a critical patient without all of the diagnostic tools they have and only end title. Maybe they would train us a little bit differently, but they don't have that. And they, do, they don't use it that same exact way. And so uh, let's just say uh, for uh, making this a little bit easier to digest, because that's purposefully I bring this all up to be confusing and address that. But let's just say that I, I died right now in this room. I'm laying here dead. You guys are talking about it to your audience on <laughs> the process of death that I'm going through, right? Now, if no one does anything, no one addresses the two variables that we can be, my breath and my chest, my pump, I'm just going to go through this process of death. So the CO2 in my blood is going to start to climb because it's not going. It's just going to rise rapidly. First four to six minutes, I'm considered viable. That's when the most cellular life is in me. It's when I got all the opportunity, and that's why it's going to climb so rapidly because essentially, like, the soup kitchen's closed, but it's still got the factory producing more CO2. And so I talk about this. I show this line where it just goes up, and then it comes back down. And then when it comes back down, it, I never really zero it out because ha being a part of some of uh, the cadaver labs that we've done, uh, we still get end tidal values when we do compressions. I, I mean, I got through, uh, do you remember seeing end tidal values mm -hmm. on cadavers? Yeah. It's anywhere from like 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury that you're still getting from people that have been dead for, like you said, two days to a few weeks. And so that's just how much cellular life is still in these people. And so, um, so let's just now say, understanding that a little bit better, my, he my heart's not pumping and my brain's not perfusing. I'm still viable. My organs are still all good to go. There's a lot of fuel going on. Let's just say that we went on a cardiac arrest, the four of us together, just down the street. Let's say that we, uh, I got in my car and got ahead of you guys, and I have some magical airway kit. Around this table, I was explaining to you guys on this cardiac arrest. We'll say it's at a, at a gym. I'm going to do my gym code. 49-year-old male, cardiac arrest at the gym. The three of you are behind. You got some kit from your department from your training right 
But you guys arrive, and I, I got there first, and again, I believe superiorly in this hypothetical scenario that the airway is far superior to uh, chest compressions, right? Like an argument I love to have as a troll, but like I don't believe that. But in this hypothetical, let's just say that by the time you guys arrive, because of this hypothetical belief, I have the patient intubated, and I'm ventilating them, and I've never addressed their chest compressions. It's a 49-year-old, chest pain. I've intubated. I'm ventilating. You guys come walking in, downtime four minutes. If you guys set a monitor down and we plugged an end title without doing any compressions, what would you expect the end title value to be? High. We'd expect the CO2 in the blood to be high, but what about the end title? If we're measuring our two variables, right? Since we're not using, we're not, we're not activating the chest, we're not activating the heart, yeah. it would be low, right? Because that's out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Right? So We've they, cleared out all the stuff without activating okay, so first, metabolism to make more, right? Yeah, so I'm scraping the bowl with yeah. my soup ladle. Yeah. And I'm mm. going to get out whatever's left on their last few breaths before they die, right? And now while I'm ventilating, waiting for you guys to arrive, I'm just dipping a ladle into an empty bowl of soup, right? That doesn't mean that it's not zero. It's just the end title is zero because mm. we've got an issue. We are not addressing a variable. So Lynn, let's just say, Steve, you recognize my weird behavior. You're cordial, but you start doing compressions. <laughs> <laughs> right? What would you expect the end title to do? Spike. It's going to go up rapidly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so that's what you should expect to happen. I, I would give people in this class a hypothetical that it goes up to 55. Well, why not 35 for this hypothetical? Back, um, back, to the, uh, back to the house fire analogy. Well, you have a variable that you created by ventilating a certain way, and now you're activating the other variable, which is right. your heart, and you haven't gotten those in sync yet. So right. one potentially is just outperforming the other. And s uh, so we've taken uh, this person that's dead for four minutes, and we closed all their windows, and we are not letting them let any smoke out. So it's going to build. Their death line is going to do what it's going to do, and then we're going to meet it. And so I, I wish I could show you guys visually, but essentially just like a healthy person, like the point of us doing chest compressions and ventilations, is we're trying to be them. We're trying to be their heart, trying to be their breath. And in another way, we're trying to regulate their CO2, and we're trying to get it as close to where it's at in the blood as possible. That's a really challenging uh, vital to find because we can't measure an ABG, right? Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. And so... Let's just do this scenario again. It's high. I put it at 55 in this hypothetical gym code because the patient's downtime allowed the smoke to build, and then we found the line, and it's higher than normal. Let's say this patient arrested in front of us, and title was 40 while we were assessing them, right? If in this hypothetical, Holly, you have this patient intubated inside a few seconds, and we're on chest compressions, so both our variables dominating. Right. What might we expect the end title to be? At that point in time, would it say around 40? It just might it just be might the be same. Yeah. Right. And so, again, these are absolute hypotheticals. I have no like case on this. But if I give you guys a gym code where we typically build fire stations close to gyms because that's populated areas. Gyms have people that are CPR trained that work there. AEDs are probably present. Maybe we just might see end title values a little closer to normal on these kind of codes compared to the unknown downtime at a care facility or at a um, apartment, right? And they last seen four hours ago and the end title's in the 90s. So you kind of see that like, mm -hmm. that, that physiology, how that might kind of play out. And so again, wouldn't it be nice if we could just measure their CO2 in their blood and then try to get as close to that as possible, right? We don't have that. We don't have the ability to do that. I put it as like we're kind of lost at sea without a lighthouse, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I have an example here to show you guys, um, but um, there's, a way to, there's a way to see how close you're going. And it starts by a process. We're really good at chest compressions. It's like, I think across the country, we're really, really good at chest compressions. We're not as consistent with the airway, right? But in the end title, 
if you're ventilating with a good process, uh, you might be able to see some things. I, I, I call it a lighthouse. Um, and I'm showing it here, and maybe I can give you some examples for your show notes yeah, if absolutely. people want to look at it. But what, you're s what we're specifically seeing here are cardiac um, oscillations. And I said that wrong for a long time. I call them oscillations because that's just what I read. I was corrected by a physician. It was embarrassing. <laughs> and then I was talking to another firefighter who knew this. And they're like, hey, are you going to talk about the oscillations? And I was like, <laughs> all right. Yeah. We're all the same. We're all the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, these oscillations here, um, you're basically, you have the airway open and you're doing chest compressions. And you're seeing the chest wall movement in the end title. You see that? Mm -hmm. You said and oscillations just means uh, back and forth. That's all it is. Now to get these, and I see them all the time, and it was really hard uh, because I had been really hyper-focusing in on the airway stuff with all that I've been teaching and then seeing it on almost every code that I run. And then there are some individuals that would pull me aside or I'd be reviewing these cases and I'd see them. So I have been looking at these for years. It's only now that I've been able to articulate a little bit further on what's going on. But the, the very important three things that you're typically seeing when you see oscillations in your end title is you have a patent airway. Because if your airway is not patent, you're not getting good movement and you're not getting enough gas exchange. Drug dealers, right? So if your airway's patent, no suction needs, you're gonna get good movement. If you're getting chest rise and fall, you're maximizing your drug dealers, getting deep into the base of the lungs. And then as that CO2 is escaping out, you're seeing the chest compressions through the end title. I mean, you can see it there. You can pretty much see the rate of what they're doing over time. So end title is now measuring another thing. You can see your compression rate. That's pretty cool. There's better ways to measure compressions. But end title's like, yeah, I got that too if you want, right? Hmm. It's pretty cool. But what more is more important is it's telling me that my variable is dominating. I might be as close as humanly possible to that bloodline and the CO2, right? And so I would question my process anyways. Easy rise, fall, fog, waves. I do it again. And then, and I didn't say this, but it takes about five to six seconds for you to see what you've done in the airway. So your monitor is your time machine looking backwards. So as I'm looking at what I just did, if I see the oscillations, then I know I'm winning. Now, oscillations, if you really look at it, they just look like Ws. So you can forget that they're even called oscillations. Just think of them as Ws for winning because that's what you're doing right now. You're winning your airway. You're winning your compressions. We've got the respiratory and the cardiac arrests addressed, and they're in sync. So now, and it's weird that you're here, because I use another example of a patient, the 49, and I name him Steve. <laughs> so nice. Now, now <laughs> you're dead, and, yeah. and I've, I'm dead in here too. And so, But anyways, how we use this, or sometimes how this is a problem, is... And I, I always use Dan as an example because Dan's intubated a lot of people. That there might be a method, like as a craftsman, he has a way that he can set up how to intubate very fast. And let's just say that that same time it takes for him to set up to intubate is the time it took for me to get all of my kit set up to ventilate a patient through a mask. So I pull the airway open, easy rise, fall, fog, waves and I have these oscillations, and my value is consistent every breath I'm giving. I might be able to take this value to heart, but I've only given this person, Steve, two breaths. So after I've given them their second breath, Dan's ready to intubate. Is this the time to intubate, right? Let me answer that, I'll keep that rhetorical. I won't argue with anyone that we don't want to upgrade the airway, because uh, ET tube, or eye gel, or king, whatever is being used, it is superior to the mask. But we, it just takes time to get those. I just pulled Steve out from underwater. He's been underwater for eight straight minutes. And then I looked at him like, hey, welcome back, brother. I know we'll have you breathing and talking in a minute, but real quick, we're going to dump you back under for two minutes, and Dan's got a plan. <laughs> See what I'm saying? And then we pull him back out. I give him a few more breaths after a failed attempt. Hey, Dan had a few problems. We couldn't seem to get that bougie <laughs> to get through. So we're going to try another thing. Go back under. Right? And so all this time, we just have not addressed both of the things, the respiratory and the cardiac. We're together now. And so I might say to Dan, 
hey, I like what I'm seeing right now. Let's hold off for a cycle, and then we'll see how it progresses. Go from there, right? So that's a way that you can objectively measure how well you're doing it's through that end title, having a process, right? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then yeah. And it's neat that like you'll s- I'll see these disappear when there's suction needs, and I'll see it timestamped to suction, and they disappear, or you can see like a ventilator changes and it's lesser tidal volume, moving less drug dealers in the waveform, they just disappear. Or chest compressions, like we rotate compressors and the wave, the, the oscillations get razor thin or completely non-existent because there's such limited chest wall movement. So I've seen that in all of these cases. That's yeah. phenomenal. Can you explain one more time what the heck oscillations are? Oscillations is a science term for just back and forth. And so, essentially, what you'd be looking for is rhythmic, prominent waveforms in your end tidal during cardiac arrest. And it's got to be that. Because you can, it's actually kind of believed to be artifact. But what you'll see, and I mean, I I brought a bunch of my cases, and you can just thumb through them. It's very rhythmic and prominent when it's well. You're driving in an ambulance, and they're bumping around. You're going to get all kinds of these little, it's not nearly as good. And explain when you're seeing the oscillations in the end title. Uh, y- you'll see, I mean, again, my process is easy rise, fall, fog, waves. And so I'm constantly on my waveforms looking at what's going on. I want to see consistency. If I give a breath and it's 25 end title and I give another breath, it's 72. And then I give a third breath, it's 26. Right? I didn't just breathe them from 25 to 76 and back down to 25. They're at 76 this whole time. So I need to s- try to stay up there and stay consistent. What I found is that when I find these n- these values, I'm pretty close to where they might truly be at. And so is that, that. those things, the up and down, because I'm a little lost, the oscillations are the CPR, the, the, yeah. the value during CPR, not the actual wave of CPR, but the value during CPR. Y- the, yes, yes. Okay. So your so airway and your perfusion are yeah. matching at that point. Correct. And you're... You're reflecting uh, the blood. Uh, 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 yeah. You'll be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> right? uh, 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 yeah. yeah. That's what's happening. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Because so without the perfusion, you won't see the oscillations. This and is a value the you're getting from an end title, inline end title th- attached to a mask. Yeah. This it's is not it, when they're innovated. It's better when it's innovated. It's better when it's innovated. Okay. So yeah. it's I'm more prominent. This. It's more, well, it depends on how well you're holding the airway. I've learned a lot of things. One thing that's really challenging with end title is that in training, you can't ever have a mannequin produce end title. So you can have like a simulator that you hit a button and then it just gives you a waveform. But it's really not, a, uh, it doesn't show all the junk that you see. And so essentially, like, Steve, you have to hold the airway open and, and not remove the mask from the face to get it to be as rhythmic as, and prominent as you see there, right? I get that, but if I were to say, pull the airway open, give a breath, and then l- release the seal and set the mask down to set some stuff up, the end title will just f- float off like this till you give your next breath. Because it doesn't have a way to come back down to normal until oxygen comes in. It comes mm-hmm. back down to bay to zero, and then you give your next breath. And if you're holding that airway, so you really, where it's wonderful is when you see it, you've I pull the airway open. I'll show you the case, but I'll pull the airway open, and if I see the oscillations, hey, I'm winning. I like this. And then if I upgrade, it should get even more rhythmic and prominent versus not, and that's what happened. Someone put a king in, and they were in the esophagus, and it was completely flatlined. And there's no way to measure the efficacy of your king. You just assume that you're in there. And it was in the stomach, and it was just flat and half the value from when we were ventilating. This first case I got that got me all these cases was showing an ineffective king airway. And it was just ventilating down to zero. And then they, is, yeah, anyways. That's very interesting. I'm staring at it right now. I'll have to put some version of this on the show notes. but Because even with the end title, if you are breathing in and out, you're getting CO2 for a while. Correct. But if you don't have perfusion behind it, you won't see the waveforms anymore. That's right. And, uh, and, um, even in the cases that I have reviewed, remember that it's not that you're winning like you're going to save this person's life or get ROSC. You're increasing those chances, but you're increasing those chances 
because you're doing so well in your process and compressions are doing, does that make sense? Sometimes end title might be 20, right? And you're getting the oscillations. All right, this might be very late in the game. I can confirm that now. I like what I'm seeing with my values. Their death curve just might have gone up and down. So I imagine you hit 55 twice, right? You probably go up on your way in the rest, and then it's up, it goes up real high, and then eventually it's going to start climbing back down, right? Wouldn't it also be nice if there was some kind of study that could help us better understand their downtime for most of our cardiac events? Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we got to find that number. I mean, it'd be even better to not worry so much about this stuff and just find a way to measure it in the blood so that we could match it with the breath. Might be able to identify rupture triple A's or PE's or trauma or all kinds of stuff. So kind of wild. Looking at that sheet that people can't see right now, there is no typical CO2 waveform on that. It look you you're calling it an oscillation, which makes a lot more sense. That yeah. doesn't look like what people might typically expect right. to see with the A B C D yep. typical capnography waveform when they deliver a ventilation. It's basically through. a sine it's a sine wave. Just right. up and down, up and down. Yeah. So are you calling and now you're showing me some more. Yeah, this is the case I'll send that you can look at. Um, okay. th this is this is a um, this is in a continuous model at the time, and uh, this is a a basic that pulled the airway open, and the end title is about fifty, and then um, they so get this is during just a BVM BVM okay uh, after recognizing poor technique, so they were doing compressions. They had had my class. That's what stimulated me to get this case. They. Um, they give 12 breaths. Uh, narrow QRS complexes just start to arrive, and then they choose to intubate. And they fail the intubation, and then they throw a king. And the king airway's got just normal-looking waveforms, which, again, you're, you, can, you guys will see in the show notes. Normal-looking waveforms, half the value. It's gone from 45 to yeah. 20. And then every breath is like an esophageal intubation where it gets lesser and lesser. And then um, by the end of this, they almost discontinued. They almost discontinued, and they attempted one more time to intubate. So failed intubation, eye gel, not working. Uh, it took them 12 minutes from when the basic ventilated the patient to getting an advanced airway placed on second attempt with a new provider, and the end title was 100. And so you can see the value is just like massive. Wow. Mm -hmm. They give us uh, six breaths and then QRS complexes show up and then another few more breaths and they have ROSC. So they just, this patient was in respiratory arrest. Once they address the respiratory issue, 18 minutes into the code, they had ROSC. So, but uh, I'm trying to make sense of the top of that waveform. When it starts to get that sine wave appearance, you're calling that an oscillation or that's what it yeah. is called as an oscillation. And we want to be seeing those. Because in school, you're literally told you want to see this nice flat plateau. And that's not incorrect, most likely, because you're intubating someone who's you are aside who wasn't in cardiac arrest. Is yeah. that the differentiating factor? I mean, yeah. Um, you want to... When you see in cardiac arrest, I mean, it's it's messy. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that it's they'd like to try to find a way to eliminate the oscillations so that they could get better trending data when they review cardiac arrest cases. But man, it's as relevant as your name in a phone book. Like you'll see it. And I don't, do your listeners need to know what a phone book is? <laughs> <laughs> they, they may. Huh? They might. Yeah. That's a that's your name in like a public book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're so like you could what call, are so you, you could call. About? Yeah, we used to have to do that. Yeah. Um, anyways, it's it's very relevant. Next code that you guys run, if you look for it, you'll see it. If you look back on your cases, and I mean almost every case that I review, I come across it. And hey, when I see W's for the winds or oscillations at the peak level of my yeah. end title reading. Tell me or tell our listeners what that is signifying. It's saying that it's icing on the cake. It's saying that 
you are going through a process, easy rise, fall, fog, waves. I look at my waveforms and my oscillations are present. My value is probably pretty good. I am in, pr I, I like where I'm at. I might sit here for a cycle or two and determine when I want to upgrade, right? Versus not having them, which would mean that we are not winning. Remember I said those are the two things? And it's okay if you don't see them. I mean, there's plenty of times when they don't arrive, but it gives me the ability to question my process. Am I getting easy rise, fall, fog waves again? Oh, crap, the end title's super low, and they've got a lot of blood in this airway. I need to address this, right? Because it can't be low. Their downtime was only six minutes. It should be much, much higher given how the factories work. And if I have both of those things, easy rise, fall, fog waves, and good chest compressions, winning both airways, low end tidal, no oscillations, all that stuff, then you can apply a differential. What might cause gas exchange issues? Could this be a PE? Could this be a triple A that's ruptured and there's just no drug dealers to make these movements? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then you can start working through that process too. It just gives you so much getting this end tidal plugged in. Yeah. Going through this process. I so almost feel like we need to supplement this podcast with a video of you in front of a whiteboard mm -hmm. yeah. and some yeah. gear. Maybe Happily. we can make that happen. And I think like when we're traditionally taught in title and it's like those nice plateau waves, mm -hmm. you have to assume perfusion. Well and for to get those waves. And the thing and we this we're this is our perfusion. These are the oscillations are the perfusion part, the good CPR part. And the good gas exchange part. That's it was it was really, uh, like especially here. And I might have uh, I keep on pointing down to my binder, but when I first started, I could only measure looking. I could only see the uh, EKG through the paddles view and the end title. And then later, I learned that there was an additional view because we had this accelerometer on the chest mm -hmm. that could measure the quality of chest compressions. And I have a very specific case where we put someone in that did bad compressions. Too fast, too shallow, no recoil. And I watched the oscillations disappear. I was like, wow. Because nothing changed. This was an intubated patient. Compressions were fantastic. Rhythmic prominent waveforms. And then we rotated. And it was like night and day of a difference. And so we don't have that with, say, our life packs. I don't even know with the Zoles. You might, you guys use some kind of way yeah. to measure. It's a, um, it's a puck that goes on the chest for... That's what we used to call it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Puck. Yeah. Peanut, puck. Mm -hmm. uh, the the puck is able to measure that. So you could look at the compression data m with your end tidal data. But we don't have that anymore. So the only way that we can truly measure perfusion is through the end tidal at that breath-by-breath breath level. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So Very let's. Uh, I lay out a few scenarios. Like let's just say that you go on a cardiac arrest. You're working this patient. You're getting easy rise fall fog waves. End tidal is in the 50s and you have these oscillations. And then all of a sudden we rotate compressors. Patient's in a uh, V-fib, we shock the patient, resume CPR. We start doing compressions to give my next breath and end title is now halved in value. It's gone from 50 to 25 and there's no oscillations. Like what can you do? What can we, f what can we do to figure this out? Right, Where, what would you think about? The first thing I would think about would be better chest compression. Yeah, right. monitor that, see what's in. going on. And so that's, that is it, absolutely. But again, when I'm not winning, and this is that first example, is I'll first question how my airway is doing. If I'm on the airway, am I getting easy rise, fall, fog? Is all of that present? And if that's all good and I feel great, something's changed. And if I evaluate, and it is exactly that, someone you've never met before, someone that looks like they're doing compressions for their first time, that's fine. We can coach them. But you'll see it that quickly. You can see end tidal. Typically, poor CPR is about a half of a value because you're just moving so much less volume. Mm -hmm. And so full recoil, good depth at a good rate. Turn on your metronomes or, you know, that can be coached, though. And then if not, you swap them out. And then here's another little um, trick. I do this thing. How do you guys – how do you guys – do you guys do continuous? Are you in continuous or do you guys yep. do 30 to 2? No, we do continuous. All right, so in continuous, there's, there's. Uh, do you guys discuss this at all, like ventilating through compressions and worry about mm -hmm. the trauma you might get? Um, yeah, we just typically, 
if we have any sort of pressure or um, resistance, we bag shallower. And how long are your rhythm checks? Um, no more than six seconds, max. Six seconds. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, ours is ten. Mm-hmm. Uh, I give uh, these bonus breaths during ventilations, uh, during the rhythm checks. Mm -hmm. And uh, six seconds is great. Give two breaths in those six seconds, right? Mm -hmm. Now let's just say, and this happened to me on an actual case, I was giving four breaths in 10 seconds. And it's like, it's pretty aggressive. One, two, three, four. And then I try to get off so they can shock the patient or do whatever they're gonna do. But what I, I like doing these ventilations because I thought of it as this opportunity to ventilate a person while we're all just standing around figuring out what we're gonna do. It's like bonus breaths is what I called it. I didn't realize at the time that it was measuring signs of perfusion. But on this one patient specifically, when I gave those four breath, those four breaths, the end title sustained. It stayed in the 40s. It's 47, all four breaths. 47, 47, 47, 47. And we had a rhythm change. The patient went from like V fib to um, sinus, 70s, but we couldn't feel pulses. So we would think this is a PEA, right? But my end title was sustaining. And I, I didn't, I was doing my bonus breaths, but I saw that. And I was like, what the heck is going on? Why is it sustaining? What might that mean? If I pull it, if I dip my soup ladle and I pull volume out, and then I dip it again and I pull the same volume out, what might that mean? You're in sync. Right, well, let's say, like, if my bowl of soup, every time I pull the ladle, I pull volume out, something's got to fill it back up, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. The heart's pumping. We just can't fill right. it. Right. And so sometimes, like, we can't detect the faint pulse. Like, mm-hmm. the stroke volume of the best compressor you know in your life that's on the code, their stroke volume, the brand of their compression, isn't going to match Gladys, who's 80, and is just resuming compressions, right? So circulation starts at the heart, and we'll see it in the breath first. In a weird way, when the patient is perfusing, if their heart's pumping, your breath is measuring blood pressures, right? So we might have ROSC. And so that, like, unexplained, like, ROSC end tidal spike is the first thing you see. It's because the first thing you do when you get ROSC is you give the patient a breath. Time. How long does it take to get a blood pressure? Depends right. on the blood pressure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it depends. How many times you have to take it? Zoles will take it on the inflation, but not in a pressure sensitive situation. So it'll be 30 seconds at best. Yeah. How many breaths can I give in 30 seconds? Right. Five, six breaths. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So if I see a higher end tile, sometimes when I bring this up, you guys are thinking about, like, well, shouldn't it spike? If it sustains, and I have a case that shows exactly this. What would it look like if it didn't s- sustain, if the end title didn't sustain, so you don't have ROSC? What would my four breaths do? They would decrease. Yeah. Every time I dip my soup ladle in, I'm pulling blood out. The heart's not putting any new blood in, so then or CO2, so then I dip again, it's lower. Lower, it'll look just like, like this, like an esophageal intubation. Mm-hmm. Like you're just exiting the dead space that's just got some CO2 in it. Mm-hmm. So it's just going to lessen, right? compared to it sustaining. And so you'll see the spike first because the circulation starts here first and the end title should sustain. So you're winning, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's pretty sick. Love that. Um, I talk about this when we get ROSC, that I'm measuring blood pressure by the breath. Even if it takes 30 seconds, if I'm wheeling a patient out and I'm giving a breath every six seconds, I'm paying attention to that, paying attention to that number. And it's 50 every time I give my adequate and consistent breath, if I started to see it go down, even instead of like stopping to check for pulses or to push the blood pressure button, I won't even wait six seconds. I'll just give another immediate breath. And if I see the value continuing to plummet, then I might question that we lost ROSC. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. That seems like something more common that people really? have experienced. Yeah, like I've That's experienced awesome. that multiple times. That's really cool. In an environment like maybe it's a loud helicopter or airplane, or maybe it's a loud ambulance, and mm-hmm. you can't, you can't feel a pulse, but you also can't hear, right. you can't auscultate a heart rate. Um, That's definitely something that 
you know. We depend on. Yeah, that we depend on, yeah. That's cool. That must come when you have, like, I feel like pre-hospitally, like, in the, it's just not hitting the same, our understanding of end title. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wish that we tracked it more frequently. Yeah. And at that breath by breath level, if you start to see it decrease on you, that you're, something's going on. And it's specifically two things. It's just your variables. Mm -hmm. Did you lose ROSC? Or, uh, or is there some kind of occlusion, suction need issue? And so uh, listen to lung sounds. Yeah. Right. I don't, know if, I don't know if you migrate the tube into the right, if that gives you a lesser value or not. I still don't know that. Hmm. And so of end title? Yeah, because you're, you're in half of a lung space, but I don't know if it's operating on that gradient, and so your value might still be the same, even though you're only in one lung. But when you think of your variables, you only have half of that now, half that variable, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I still don't know. I mean, I guess I don't know if it would change. Because you're still exchanging yeah. oxygen at whatever rate, yeah. right? It's not measuring, like, the amount of... It's not a me it's it's a function of how much CO two is dissolved in the blood that's then metabolized into the end title that comes out, the the gas that comes out, right? That's like when you have really sick patients and you don't know where to start for their CO two using Winter's formula helps because it's a function of their bicarb, and then CO two is the byproduct of bicarb, right? H two O and CO two, and that's what you breathe out. And so it's, I think. If it's a w in one lung, I still don't know if it would change, it would change the okay. amount, but it might. So I, I don't know. But don't I'm thinking in my mind that it might not. Yeah, I tried running it through ChatGPT, and I uh, looked at some. I tried looking at studies because I assume that there's a lot of right stem yeah. research papers. But from it would increase. It would decrease your SpO2 probably. So it might ACC decrease your yeah, end title. Totally. Yeah. Um, Good question. Yeah. Good question. Uh, so yeah, that's a like. I I'm sure I could keep going, but what I will say, like for, like the sake of your listeners, or like if the stuff's all new, is that if you're ventilating with a process, if you feel like you're not winning and your process doesn't seem right, mm -hmm. then you can take action. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I might hear gurgling, in that ROSC phase, but I'm getting great exchange and everything's consistent, and so I might get stuff ready, but it's not until I start seeing it going down mm -hmm. I don't dress it and maybe we could talk about just the uh hypercarbia because I, I don't know what what your guys's plan is when you have an antitidal at 90 on scene and you're in rosk what your airway plan is by arrival as far as your high value your hypercarbia i know the oversimplified version we learned was if their co2 is low go slow if it's high fly with your ventilations, but I think right. that's overly simple. Yeah, but I do think we it really want to depend on do the that. underlying? Right, depends you know. on what caused them to go into cardiac arrest. I mean, if you have hypercarbia, nothing works right. Like your drugs aren't going to be metabolized right. Hmm. You can have inter increased intracranial pressure. Like it, it's with everything because you know our bodies like yeah. homeostasis. So, unless that's a COPD or that lives at ninety, yeah, I don't know. That's a really good question a pre-hospital yes. that's a and if it's low it could be you as a variable that's making it low yeah and they're not low i just talked to a buddy who went to us san diego for an ems thing and there's some practices that are not giving shocks to patients mm -hmm. with end title less than 20 mm -hmm. and they could be in like a coarse v fib with end title less than 20 but i I mean, uh, that's pretty cool, it, but it's just like, if if the end title is 20, and it's because of what we're doing, maybe that patient should have been shocked. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sure. Are they truly at 20? We need to get these numbers. Like, like either CPR is not as good, or we're bagging too Correct. fast. And then we get an end title of 20, and that's the most frustrating part, is in the beginning of this whole class, I said, hey, end title 65, and you chart that as 65, and that goes to QI review, and then the doctors weigh in on what might have been going on when really this patient was at 95 the entire time. We never mm -hmm. measured that. But it was, it's going to be 65 forever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it's, I think that's the big steps backwards and getting consistent, plugging end title in as frequently as possible at first breath 
and then there's got to be some kind of QI or research that's being done for us to better understand how to use this vital to our benefit, better understand what, where we're at in the stage of this code and how to take action. That's rad, man. Isn't it? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's making my brain and I'm go like, in a thousand different <laughs> I know, circles. me too. <laughs> yeah. I love yeah. it because you said at the beginning that things are getting better. And when we first got Entitle introduced, it was like, put Entitle on to confirm to placement. Yep. Mm-hmm. Here are the numbers it should be. Bam. Go, uh, go out and do your thing. Bag to these numbers. Right. Uh, and this, now. This case here, the crew arrived at the hospital and Entitle was 72. And so at timestamp arrival to the ED, the crew ventilated the patient 43 breaths in 37 seconds to wow. get them from 72 to 35. The patient arrested a minute or two later in the ED on the transfer care. And that whole time they were giving a breath every six seconds and title was 72 the entire time and totally sustained. And they didn't do anything wrong. Again, I always assume good intent. Mm-hmm. What they did that was right is they did a once through like, hey, how's blood pressure? How's, oh, and title's high. Ah, I need a good report card, right? I don't want a doctor yep. to yell at me. Mm-hmm. God, could you imagine as a patient, like, this is the best. I'm, I finally arrived at the ED. They've been taking good care. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know, just, like, yeah. just getting leveled, right? <laughs> That's just because of how the protocol reads. Get the end title of 35. And uh, that blew my mind. I was like, wow, look at what this is, ha- what this is doing. And we get so focused on our numbers. Um, and then uh, you guys talked about, well, here's another little one I can throw at you guys because I'm having a really good time here. Um, <laughs> the... Uh, like, what if you prided yourselves on on how much of a spike you have when you get ROSC, right? What if you worked a patient and you had no spike? You should wear that like a badge of honor, right? The greater the spike, the That's lesser right. you were performing, right? Never that even kind of thought of that. Right? So the spike in end title, if you go from 50 to 80, it's like, well, what were you doing? Why, why, why was 30 points on the table here? You could have been yeah. doing whatever, right? So, yeah, I'd love it if we got there one day. A lesser spike. Hmm. Get as close to you can at that bloodline. That's why we see it at the beginning, right? Um, and then the now now you had discussed it, but the peep, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I just think there's some things that we could be doing, just measuring perfusion and giving, giving our line personnel the, the ability to decide when we should put it on or when we should, okay, we'll stop it right here. I'm really happy with this number. Mm-hmm. Because if you're getting good perfusion through your end title readings, you should be able, I mean, for us, we're, we're not able to do it right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we might be putting on the ITDs, the impedance threshold, threshold devices. Yeah. Do you guys know much of that? I, I don't. We had them years ago as a trial. Mm-hmm. We I use them on every code. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Work pretty good. <laughs> is, is it just decreasing? We know the Is it just decreasing inner thoracic pressure? Do I say Venturi and then I'm, I know it better? <laughs> no, um, the thing I have in my head is a video of how the device actually works. It's helping pull blood in. You know, it, it's every time this comes up, I pull up the video because yeah. I'm never going to say it 100 percent correctly, and the video shows it. I've um, used it before in, on internship, yeah. um, and what I remember from it was forgetting to take it off uh-huh. on Rosk, yeah. and then the tube starts filling with blood. Mm-hmm. Oh wow. Yeah, so it's just really, really a suck. Yeah. 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 Um, we have to remind people not to use them during RSIs. Um, we've had that happen before. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Cardiac <Yeah>. arrest only. <clears throat> um, interesting. Yeah. But I think the PEEP is interesting just because PEEP is oxygenation. Like, if your stats are low, you give PEEP. Um, if your end title is low, you ventilate. Like, it's, it is... Yeah. Like you can control your respirations, but um, so I don't know how it would really affect perfusion, but I think it could affect oxygenation in a code situation. Yeah. Someone who's been without oxygen for so long, but man, I really like how you put it. I'd love to do it. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I'm looking up the ITD non-invasive device that delivers intrathoracic pressure regulation during basic or advanced life support to improve perfusion. Um, Rescue pod, TD, another name for it, opens to allow air to escape during compression. So it's creating 
more negative pressure? Doubles blood flow to the heart. Increases blood flow to the brain by 50%. percent Lurie et al., 1998. And increases survival from cardiac arrest by 25% or more, according to an article in Resuscitation by Yiannopoulos in 2015. Mm. Wow. All and right. it also has this, like, you can turn it on or off, but there's, like, a little toggle switch on the top of it. Mm. And it'll illuminate every six, six seconds. Six seconds. I remember that. Yeah. Mm. While it's working. Yeah, to give you a visual for when to give a breath. Give a breath. But have you noticed any increase in survivability? Um, like anecdotally, not that you have to. Pr- put we this have on the yeah. Um, we went to a. We basically implemented the Rialto model mm-hmm. with the ten steps, um, and me and Alan Jones kind of led the charge on that. Is that including the heads-up CPR thing? Yeah. Okay. We just started doing that this last year. And I feel like I'm hearing about a lot more code saves. I don't have anything specific to... Like Can I ask you a question? Is this yeah. device to be used in conjunction with the heads-up CPR? Or is it? can it be used on... Is that uh, what you're, how you're using it? I'm trying to think of the logical sequence of events. We don't put them in heads up CPR until they're on the auto pulls. Gotcha. So um, you're using the and by other device first. We would be intubating shortly after that. Yeah. So in theory it's used for a little while while they're in heads up mode and mm-hmm. then we put them on a ventilator. So in that case it'd be hard to know is it the heads up CPR that's improving or is it the other thing or is it both yeah, together? Yeah. Remember when we talked to yeah, mm-hmm. I do. Um, mm-hmm. Joe Powell? He said he was implementing as many things that he could find They th- that they had found evidence for a possible improvement in outcomes. Mm-hmm. And so that w- it was kind of a shotgun approach on some level. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Are you guys doing heads up CPR? No. 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 We've heard about it. Yeah. I think is that Fire Department California? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think Clackamas is doing it. Is that Are true? They? I think Multnomah um, County is going to start have. doing it too. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Freaked some nurses out the first time I brought it in. <laughs> I bet. What the fuck are you guys doing? It does kind of like. If you don't know anything about it, it does kind of go against everything you've ever heard about perfusion, which is to lay them down or put their legs up, or, you know, and yeah. sort of sit them up. Um, but, when but it makes more sense once you know. What when you talk through yeah. it, right, like if you were plumbing a house, you would want pressure to and from a device, right? Because mm-hmm. it's important to deliver it with pressure and also to help use gravity to your advantage to mm-hmm. pull it back out. And if you just have this flat pipe laying there, you know, and you're yep. it's going, 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 yeah. and there's nothing helping mm-hmm. go back the mm-hmm. other way. And you need that yeah. that cycle. So it's one of those things that, yeah, that makes sense. And then you're like, but is it really <laughs> helping? <Yeah. laughs> we just don't we just don't know. Yeah. I don't think we can say definitively yet. But how, what how do they address their airway? Which in in a code? Yeah. No differently really in the sense of, I mean, you're going to, I can show you the 10 steps. Um, you're going to show up, you're going to do BLS airway to start to get things rolling. And then you roll into um, advanced airway after you have a few more things in place. But it's it's like a hierarchy of things that they have shown are beneficial during cardiac arrest. So because BLS airway is so much more important than ALS airway um, during those initial phases, it's it's pushed back in terms of the step it comes. Um, let me see if I can so were you wondering how they're doing good BBM while they're sitting up? Is that what you were thinking? Well, it mind? sounds like do they, they must get an advanced airway by that point. Before they You're gets. basically, once their head goes up, you're doing your advanced airway at that point. Gotcha. Upright? Mm-hmm. It's just like some NASCAR technique or something? It's like at 30 degrees. Yeah. Oh. Which is actually perfect. 
What about eye gel? Yeah. Is that considered advanced airway? Or is, um, that, is that okay it's too? It's a more permanent airway, but yeah. it's not like we call it the intermediate. Yeah. Airway. But that's acceptable and that's heads up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, manual compressions, stat pads placed, BLS airway management. Um, you know, it is interesting. We do put BVM ventilations delivered with capnography on here. Yeah. Nice. See, look at you. I, so. yeah. I taught that I didn't even think about it that way. Uh, place the auto pulse, heads up CPR. Uh, we do uh, passive oxygenation during the intubation. So we're just putting mm-hmm. high flow to into, mm-hmm. you know, the nose for a minute. I think for anyone, if you're trying to measure the efficacy of how you're running codes, um, I hope we get there one day, but documented gas exchange, I think, is a fantastic vital to start tracking. Mm-hmm. Like, truly, like, when you see CO2 going out, just document that. Mm-hmm. Like, time and tidal plugged in is great because that's just getting crews to get it plugged in before first breath. But that's, I think it's that's... It's not our KPI yet. No. I wrote, I, r- I tried to write some KPIs, but we just don't have it as one. Um, but it's one, th- it's one thing to just, like, oh, I think that was a good breath. I saw chest rise and fall. <laughs> a whole nother thing to document it mm-hmm. with the data that's confirming you were successful it gives you a lot on the back end too. yeah for sure right um we place an ng tube after we intubate ivio meds transport that's, that's cool flow. that's exciting yeah uh i think it's working um yeah time will tell right time will tell and it's meant to be adjustable because, like, for us to ever assume we've we've found it, you know, I think we're just lying to ourselves at that point. But, hmm. um, all right, we got to wrap this up. So, did we hit everything? Yeah, yeah. And the answer? Yeah. Sweet. So I don't know about you guys, but my brain <laughs> is spinning. <laughs> it was so many full. things that are just awesome that I haven't really thought about before. Um, but. Bruce, you've given me at least ten things to think of and examine more closely on the next cardiac arrest. Yeah, that I think yeah. Of, and I, I really, really like that. Let me end it. Yeah, I, I can give you something uh, more. Uh, it's okay if you forget it all. Mm-hmm. I, I welcome everyone to forget most of what's been discussed today because the time that you run critical airway related calls, it's hard to think on new stuff, and you know. I only wish it was like a minority report situation where we n- knew what was coming and then we could take action, right? Mm-hmm. Like, be nice if I n- ran PED code training right before PED code. But no, it doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. Some of your listeners might not get to do any of this stuff for months mm-hmm. or longer. And so just know this, that you you can't... I end my whole thing with a picture of this person with a bag over their head. And you can't you can't save a life without ventilating a patient. So there's always a bag on their head until we address that need. And so I would argue anyone that you couldn't save my life. You put a bag on my head and watched me go into arrest. I kill myself a lot in all my classes, right? And so if you brought the best, your medical director and the best team of doctors to try to make, you know, their best attempt, given all the modern medicine, equipment, everything they have, they will not save my life but they'll look fantastic trying. And how different is that in how we run calls, how we rotate compressors, and how we're efficient we are at putting all our kits in the right spots. It ends with a blanket over the patient, just like it will me. And so I challenge anyone that's listening to ask just that question. Is there a bag on their head? No matter where you are in seniority, where you're at, if you're on a coat at a grocery store and there's a Safeway bag over the patient's head, you have every right to just pull that off, literally without even asking for permission, right? But to do it in a real world sense, because there isn't a PAG overhead, plug in end title, right? If you do that, you're now objective. You can explain why someone's being ineffective. And if they're being stubborn and unwilling to compromise with what you're seeing, um, know that it can't be unseen. You're gonna now do things longer and it's gonna get worse and it's hard to watch. Just like you were talking about when we talked earlier, it's just like, you see poor technique, mm-hmm. address it because it's it's all for naught if you don't if you don't fix that. 
And my move is typically to just really start talking about it objectively enough to confuse them that they let me take over. <laughs> that's, my, that's my move. <laughs> And it's it a works. power play. Nice work. It's <laughs> quite a power play. Mm -hmm. um, but that's it. Take the bag off their head. Yeah. Right on, man. Well, let's leave it there. Thank you guys for joining us and hanging out. And I'm going to go stew on this for probably the next couple weeks. Right. You should. It's great stuff. <laughs> oh, man, reach out. Yeah. Uh, this stuff lives in my head. Stared, yeah. I've stared at many ceilings. <laughs> you know. I'll hit you up a bunch. Awesome. Yeah. We'll leave it there. Thanks again, guys.